picture. I'm showing it to you at some fixed value of u. Um, so again, I'm showing it to you at u equals one. Okay, so in this case, the you know the sigma u is given by the equation lambda cubed plus phi two lambda plus phi three equals zero. Um, so that has some branch points where the discriminant of this is zero. The discriminant is you know the cube of this minus the square of that. So okay, it turns out there's four discriminant points, um, and for each one of them, we shoot out the trajectories. Um, and what do we get? Well, we get some slightly more interesting picture. Right, first of all, the things can cross each other now. They couldn't before, because before, they all satisfied the same differential equation. They, were, they lived in a global foliation. But now, they satisfy different equations, so they can cross each other. And when they cross each other, I told you our rule, when they cross each other, we just shoot out another one. Um, and so sure enough, here when they cross each other, we shoot out another one, and we get some picture. Okay, slightly more complicated looking picture, but fine. Um, once again, we can kind of vary the phase and see how the picture changes. There's some critical moments where something happens. Uh, well, it's a picture in the, the patch of CP1 uh, that's missing infinity. So it, it's a picture, it, yeah, so we're taking our curve on which everything is happening to be CP1, but we're allowing everything to have a singularity at infinity. So all the pictures are drawn in the complex plane. No, 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 they don't, they don't come back. Yeah, good. So um, in, I mean, that's a, that's a dynamical question you have to answer in each example. In this particular example, the singularity is strong enough that they, it attracts them and they never come back. That's actually what makes these examples much easier um, is the fact that they have this singularity that tracks all the lines. Um, had we not had that singularity, the, the lines would tend to kind of wind ergodically around the, the, uh, the Riemann surface. That makes the pictures much harder to draw. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so, so this is, this is our, our, our new notion of a uh, um, spectral network. Um, uh, it's introduced in, in a, a paper of Gato, Moore, and me. Um, uh, okay, fine. So, um, now as I've alluded to, there's a new phenomenon that occurs here that didn't occur in the sort of pure two-dimensional examples that we talked about before, which is that uh, Sn of theta and u jumps at some critical phases. Theta equals theta critical. Um, so let me go back to the sort of simplest example of that. Uh, well, actually, here's the very simplest example. Um, this is a case of a quadratic polynomial. But here, this already shows you the basic feature. Um, so now I've just got two zeros. Uh, as I change the phase, there is a critical moment, we're coming close to it, where the topology of the picture suddenly jumps. Right, you see two lines going into the northwest and southeast, and then bang, suddenly they're going the other way. Um, and right at the moment when the jump occurs, you can see what's kind of special. What's special is the appearance of this trajectory that connect, directly connects the two uh, 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 branch points. Um, uh, so, and, so at theta critical, we have a picture like this. We have a trajectory that goes straight between um, these, two, uh, these two branch points. So that kind of thing has a name. This is, like, this is a classically studied thing in, uh, in Teichmuller theory. So if you Google for, it's called a saddle connection. If you just Google for saddle connection, you get, there's also something in like welding that's called a saddle connection. But if you Google saddle connection, Teichmiller theory, then you get a lot of references to the right thing. Um, uh, so we're gonna, these are gonna be a new kind of particle for us. Um, we're gonna keep track also of the charge of this particle, and the charge of that particle is something simple and geometric here. Namely, let's remember we have this covering, 
sigma u, which is branched over these points. Um, so associated to this saddle connection, there's a very natural homology class up here. Namely, I just take the saddle connection and I lift it up to the cover in both possible ways with opposite orientation. There's some way of fixing the orientation. Um, uh, and exactly because these are branch points, that thing, this thing will be a closed cycle. Um, and I'll call that cycle uh, gamma. It lies in the lattice capital gamma sub u, which by definition is the first homology of the spectral curve. Um, uh, so we'll call it a saddle connection with charge gamma. Um, uh, well, that's not the only kind of topology change that you get in this business. Um, uh, so in some cases, the simplest kinds of topology change come from the saddle connections, but there's also other things that happen. Um, so, uh, so other, let's see, how can I say it? Uh, other objects that cause um, topology jumps for the spectral network. Um, so one that can happen already in this double cover situation is you can have trajectories that actually go start at a branch point and end at the very same branch point. Um, and when you get them, you actually get a ring of them. So you get something like this. So a whole family of closed trajectories. So let me call that a ring domain. Um, and another thing that can happen in the higher rank situation, but not in the um, uh, not in the SL2 situation, is you can have a, something like this. You can have three leaves of different foliations that come together. A one, three, uh, yeah, three, two, and one, two, like this. When this kind of object appears, it also causes a topology change. I'll call this a finite web. And maybe I'll show you a picture of that one, how that one happens. Here's the simplest example of that one. Um, so this is, this is with, um, this is an example where I have um, phi two is four z dz squared, and phi three is uh, epsilon, whatever epsilon is. Epsilon is one, okay. Phi three is dz cubed. Um, so there, I'll, ju I'll just show you what the, what the pictures look like for that example. Um, so as we change the phase, here's the spectral network, and now as we change the phase, it starts to look like this. And now we're coming close to the critical moment. Okay, and you see what the picture looks like here, and now we go through the critical moment where there's that three-string web, and on the other side it looks like this, so it goes. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so, um, uh, so we have these kind of special kind of finite objects that can appear inside of the spectral network, and when they do, the topology of the thing suddenly jumps. Um, now, the importance of these jumps for us, well, they're gonna be important in our scheme for studying Higgs bundles, but, but first, uh, they're physically important. Um, Uh, so these jumps are associated to BPS particles. So again, BPS particles, but this is a kind of BPS particle that we haven't talked about until this moment. So, so far we've been always talking about things that live on the little string. Um, uh, but now we're gonna talk about BPS particles of the full four dimensional theory. Uh, in its vacuum, uh, U. Um, so for example, for G equals SL2, um, I could define 
let me define the invariant that counts these BPS particles. Um, omega of gamma and u. So this is for any gamma in the lattice gamma, which was, remember was the first homology of sigma u. Um, omega of gamma and u is counting. So it counts the number of saddle connections with charge gamma minus two times the number of ring domains with charge gamma. Um, so also for the ring domain, you can define a charge. Just lift this loop up to both sheets, um, take their difference, um, uh, and you get an element of gamma. Um, so that's a kind of, so that's a mathematical definition of a number. The way you're supposed to think of it physically, Um, what do you mean by generic? Uh, they, they, don't, they don't occur in these polynomial examples. Um, they occur essentially generically in any example that's fancier than these polynomial examples. So they're kind of equally, in, in, in sort of typical examples, they're sort of equally generic as the saddle connections. Um, uh, so there may be some domains of the Coulomb, some domains of the Hitchin base where they don't exist, but there's plenty of domains where they do exist. Um, so, so physically, this quantity omega of gamma of u is a BPS index counting uh, uh, BPS particles of charge gamma um, uh, in the theory T4 of G in vacuum U. Ah, very good, very good. So. Um, we didn't talk about it in lecture, but in the notes, I wrote down the kind of the, defini the general definition of such an index in terms of the representation theory of the supersymmetry algebra um, uh, in uh, um, n equals two supersymmetry in four dimensions. And so just like the n equals two comma two situation, you count things, but you have to count things with signs in general in order to get an invariant. Um, so here, unlike the, unlike the uh, um, the two-dimensional case. In the four-dimensional case, there's a bunch of different kinds of short representation. So in fact, the saddle connection is giving you one kind of short representation, which is called the massive hypermultiplet. And the ring domain is giving you a different kind of short representation, which is called the massive vector multiplet. And so I wrote about what those representations actually are, if you look back in the, the end of the notes from the first lecture. Um, uh, but anyway, I think all we need to know right now is that there's some BPS index that counts these things, um, like the indices I defined for you before, and this number, omega of gamma, that we're computing in this way is one of those BPS indices. Um, okay. Um, you sum over all theta, so, so you look at the theta where the saddle connection appears. Um, uh, yeah, so for, for, every, for every charge gamma, there's only one theta where the saddle connection could appear. In fact, this is the argument of uh, Z gamma. Um, yeah, maybe that, that's one of the things I should say. For these particles, so just like before, they have a central charge, Z gamma, which is just the period, just the period of the uh, holomorphic one form over the cycle gamma. That gives the, the central charges of these particles. Um, okay. Uh, so, so now in the end, I want to try to um, I want to try to sketch out what's one kind of geometric application of this stuff, of this construction. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
In the examples from before, it would be zero. Th because this has to do with, well, it would have been zero for two reasons, right? It would have been zero because this homology lattice would have been trivial. Um, but, but also morally, it should be zero exactly because this has to do with the four-dimensional physics. This, this has to do with a phenomenon that happens in the four-dimensional theory, T4 of G and C. Um, in our previous examples, there was no four-dimensional theory. Everything was happening in just two-dimensional physics. So this is a new phenomenon that occurs here and didn't occur in those other examples. Uh, let's talk about it later. Um, uh, for sure, there can't be any BPS particles because all the periods will be zero. This lambda is exact in that situation. Um, uh, okay, so so let me try to uh, sketch for you the the application. So so among the properties of this spectral network, S n of theta of u. Um, So um, it controls, in, in the same sense as before, it controls Stokes phenomena happening on the curve C. Um, for families of connections, so just as before, we had these two families of connections, which I called nabla h bar and nabla zeta. Um, So here too, if I take, in fact, any Higgs bundle, E over C, whose spectral curve, whose spectral curve is given by sigma u. Um, so yeah, so, sorry, so I, I take my curve, I've got my, I got my Riemann surface, um, I put a Higgs bundle on that Riemann surface, um, its spectral curve is gonna be one of the spectral curves uh, sigma u, where u are the points of the, of the Hitchin base. Um, and now I want to study, uh, I, I, eventually I'd like to do non-abelian Hodge theory, so I'd like to solve Hitchin's equations, but I don't do it directly. Instead, I study these one-parameter families of connections first, so let me remind you. Um, one-parameter family of connections. So, This one parameter family of connections, nabla zeta, was phi over zeta plus the churn connection dh plus phi dagger zeta, um, where h is the harmonic metric. The solution of Hitchin equations associated to our Higgs bundle, our Higgs bundle E phi. Um, yeah, Higgs bundle, I should write it as E phi. over C. Um, uh, so you recall that whenever you, have a, whenever you have a Higgs bundle, by solving Hitchin equations, you can produce this one parameter family of flat connections. And now I want to study this one parameter fam family of flat connections. The way I'm going to do it, as before, is to study its uh, Stokes phenomena at, at small zeta. And for that, the key tool is exactly this uh, spectral network. So let me say, let me say exactly what I mean. So the way it works is a little bit subtler than before. Um, so before, um, in the previous story, I said, well, you look in the, you look in the uh, complement of the spectral network. In every domain of the complement, you just get a distinguished basis of, of sections. Um, in that distinguished basis, you know everything about their asymptotics. That was, gonna be a, that was a good way of studying those connections. Here, we don't get exactly that. We don't get exactly a distinguished basis. of nabla zeta flat sections um, in each domain. Rather, what we get is a distinguished line decomposition.
So before, we were kind of trivializing this connection completely in every domain of the complement of the spectral network. Now we're not trivializing it. What we're going to do is we're going to reduce it to something abelian. Um, and so here's the precise conjecture. So the conjecture is like this. So there exists uh, a family of flat GL1C connections. Uh, I'll call them nabla zeta ab over the spectral curve sigma u. Um, so remember the sigma u, which projects to c, let pi be the projection, um, such that the following things happen. Um, so number one, these connections have to carry somehow the same information as the connection that I'm really interested in studying. So what I want to do is to study this connection. I'm going to relate it to these connections over the spectral cover like this. So the statement is that away from the spectral network, the theta equals argument of h bar, um, uh, there's an isomorphism uh, iota, which identifies nabla zeta with the push forward of nabla ab comma zeta. What that means in concrete terms What that means in concrete terms is um, if I have some path that's avoiding the spectral network, let's say the spectral network is somewhere over here. Um, if I have some path in the base curve, and I want to do the parallel transport of my flat connection along this path. To understand this flat connection, what I'd like is to understand its parallel transport. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, they're both flat. Yeah, absolutely. These are flat. Sorry, that's very important. Hitchin equations exactly means that this is a one parameter family of flat C star connections. And we're, we're trying to describe in some efficient way that one parameter family of flat connections. If we can do that, we can, for example, find the hyperkähler metric. Um, so we want to understand these connections. The way we're going to understand them is to describe their parallel transport in a concrete way. And the first thing I'm saying is, away from the, um, away from this spectral network, uh, the parallel transport can be related just to parallel transport in a, in a line bundle over sigma. So like in this picture, we've got some rank three bundle. We're trying to do the parallel transport. And we just relate it to a sum of three line bundles here, and we do the parallel transport in those three line bundles. It's not as good as having a distinguished flat basis. If I had a flat basis, that would be even better. But this is almost as good. I just relate it to three abelian things. Um, so that's what this number one says. Number two says, so away from the spectral network, it's as good as it could be. Um, uh, at a wall of the spectral network of type, say, ij, this isomorphism jumps. But it jumps in a very specific way. It jumps by kind of like the change of bases that we wrote before. It's a unipotent matrix, um, which looks like the identity plus some number times uh, the elementary matrix Eij. So just the kind of change of basis that we were writing before. That same kind of change of basis uh, uh, intervenes here. So that says, if I want to do the parallel transport along this path, It'll be almost the abelian parallel transport, except that when I get to here, I'll have to splice in some explicit unipotent matrix. That's still pretty good. We can control that um, if we know exactly where the spectral network is. Um, OK. Now, the conjecture is not done yet. Um, so far, this part is, is, if you only wanted this, it wouldn't be that hard to get. Um, Uh, th so this conjecture is in GMN, by the way. Um, uh, if C was compact, 
I would formulate the same conjecture, actually, but it would be much, you know, when you press me about details, it would be very tricky to say it precisely, right? Because in that case, the spectral network is dense. So I have to be very careful. In, uh, yeah, so morally, yes, but in practice, it's a serious thing. Um, Aaron Fenyes has done some work in that direction. Um, but for now, let me just stick to, I'd be very happy to do it just in any one of the examples I showed you. Um, uh, okay. So I'll finish just by stating the rest of this conjecture. Um, so one and two are kind of algebraic in nature, um, but the, the third thing is definitely not. So suppose I define now a function, x gamma of zeta, to be the holonomy of nabla, uh, what's my notation, nabla ab zeta around the loop gamma. Um, so you know, here's sigma again. Here's C. I related my connection down here to an abelian connection up here. And now I just look at its holonomy around a loop. Those are, in some sense, the only real invariants of this connection. Um, I take this holonomy around the loop. Um, the statement is that that function has nice controllable asymptotic behavior. It goes like exponential of z gamma over zeta plus something of order one as zeta goes to zero. Um, so this is a function with a kind of 